Thomas. Um, we are here to talk about measuring progress during COVID times. My name is Amy Halpert and I am of counsel here at Littman Crooks. I am also a special education and elementary education teacher by background and I have a child with a learning disability. So I personally come to this particular topic with a lot of sensitivity and from various different perspectives and I'm really happy to be chatting with you all here today. Um, I have a lot of material that I'd like to cover with you and I would be so grateful if you might save your questions until the end and feel free to populate the chat box as, we, um, as we're talking today, but I'd like to address as, as many questions as I can at the conclusion of the presentation. I have some um, slides today that I'd like to use as talking points to help us move along. Um, special education is filled with a lot of defined terms and a lot of jargon, quite frankly. And when I was putting together this presentation, I came up with my own summary sentence of what I'd really like to discuss with you today and what I'd like to try to unpack. So when I think of measuring progress, I think of the ongoing collection. And when I say ongoing, I mean a systematic, regular, consistent method. So an ongoing collection of meaningful data. And when I use the word meaningful, I mean data that is really informed by the goals and the objectives that are in your IEP. So the ongoing collection of meaningful data, which is analyzed. So I stress that it must be analyzed because this data can't live in a vacuum or else it's not good to any of us. The ongoing collection of meaningful data, which is analyzed in order to de determine progress. So in order to determine if our IEP is actually effectuating a educational benefit to your child. So to, de to determine progress or lack thereof, or to make a change. And I know that that is a mouthful and I wanna unpack with you today what each of those components really mean. I'd like to discuss with you what kinds of data we need to be considering. How do you collect and maintain that data during these COVID times? Um, what we are looking for to make meaning of that data and how has this whole process changed during the time of the pandemic? So I have been listening to a lot of podcasts. I'm sure you all have as well. Um, I was listening to one the other day and a special education attorney said, um, if I hear the word unprecedented one more time, I think I'm gonna be sick. And I chuckled because I think this resonates with all of us. Um, it's tricky out there right now in our schools. And if you have more than one child at home, it's probably feeling like a version of the Wild West. I mean, you might have kids at school on Monday and Wednesday or just in the morning or just in the afternoon. Maybe you're home because you need to self quarantine. If you are home remote learning, um, you may find that you have synchronous instruction where you are one on one with a teacher providing direct instruction. It may be asynchronous. So we're really going through some tricky times. Um, but what I want to really um, emphasize today is that even though we're really in a time of crisis, we, schools are still accountable and we still have to be collecting and maintaining and analyzing data because decisions regarding special education programming are driven by that data. And what I hope you'll come away with today is this understanding that um, you are very uniquely positioned if you can come to your IEP table or your committee on special education with some documentation that you can share about how your child is doing. Um, you really have a very significant voice. So I want to spend um, a hot second, as my 10-year-old daughter would say, talking very quickly about our COVID climate. Um, the OSEP, which is the Office of Special Education Programs that is a part of the Department of Education, which oversees and monitors our IDEA, another acronym, our Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, has confirmed to us what, what we do know, which is that um, our 
state educational agencies and our local education educational agencies and our IEP teams are not relieved of their obligation to provide a FAPE, a free and appropriate public education to each child with a disability under the IDEA. So there is no waiver of FAPE. Um, you should not be signing any waivers if you should be discussing anything that comes home to you looking like a waiver, but there has been no waiver of FAPE during this pandemic. School districts must ensure to the greatest extent possible that each child with a disability is provided the special education and related services that are identified in that student's IEP. So even though this is a time of an emergency, um, schools still have to provide that special education, those special education and related services. It's just not going to be in the same manner that they're typically, those services and that education is typically provided. And I like to think of this in terms of the what and the how and the when. And the what being the services that are delivered. So the what has not changed during our COVID times. It's the how that has been changed, how those services are being delivered, and when those services are being delivered. And that's what I'd like you to have in the back of your mind as we go through this presentation today and also when we're thinking about documenting how our children are doing in a remote environment. By the same token, for another hot second, as my daughter would say, um, progress monitoring has not been waived. Um, teachers and service providers must continue to collect data, whether in person or remotely, and they use that data to monitor each child's progress. So the IDEA actually requires progress monitoring. It's built into the IDEA. Our IEP contains a statement of how um, your child's progress is going to be measured. Um, by the same token, that um, progress monitoring provision requires that the IEP specify how, you're, how you as a parent are going to be informed of your child's progress toward goals. So why? Why is it important to determine student progress? Um, it may be obvious, but I think it's worth really understanding the why behind it. We need to determine student progress in order to understand the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance of your child. Um, this is very specific, detailed, explicit information about the grade level performance of your student. It is a description of your child's strengths and weaknesses. It helps us understand what limits or interferes with your child's learning. It's usually in the form of objective data from current evaluations, but it's a picture as well as to how the disability of your child affects his or her ability to be involved in and to progress in the general education curriculum. So that is the first component as to why we need to do this. We obviously need to identify students that are not making adequate progress. And then finally, we need to determine um, whether and to what extent school closure has disrupted learning. So determining progress, progress monitoring in and of itself is used to alter the instructional variables that are better um, to better meet the needs of individual students. Um, at the end of the day, um, we are trying to design effective individualized programs for struggling learners. And this is why we do this. So what's data, right? We're, we're progress monitoring and we're looking at data. Um, and it's really important to understand that data exists in a multiplicity of forms. Um, you could spend an entire weekend on this one slide. Um, I just want to give a Cliff Notes version and hit, hit these very briefly so that you have an understanding of all of these components and how they are part of the equation um, for your child. So starting up at the top, we have statewide assessment data. So these are the learning goals 
for what all students in your state should know and should be able to do at each grade level. Um, it's important um, to know, to have an understanding that these are out there, especially if you're feeling like your goals are not appropriately ambitious or they're not challenging. Um, you can always take a look at these state standards and then look at what your child's goals are and say, hey, wait a minute, can we try to backward map some of the skills that my child needs? Because look at what the standard is. Um, it's really kind of easy to figure out what these are. I wanted to just, I thought this might be kind of a fun tidbit for you to know about. There are some really great app, there's an app out there. You can literally download New York State Standards you can look for the standard, you know, the, the area that you're interested in, whether it be mathematics, language arts. You can then click on grade level and you have right there what the standard is. So there are easy ways to figure out what, the, what our state standards are and to co compare them to what your goals are for your child. Your local jurisdiction assessment data um, this is going to be the assess, these are the assessments that are done by your district at regular intervals. These are going to be your quarterly benchmarks. You may be familiar with your map testing. So these are measures of academic progress. And what's terrific about these tests is that they're usually given once or twice a year in a normal world. And schools keep this data over a period of time. So you can really go back and track some gaps. So if you, have, if you had that second grader who was performing at the first grade level a couple years ago, and now that second grader is a fourth grader who's performing at a second grade level, that's really some meaningful data in terms of how that gap has increased. Um, regular school testing data, these are things like the um, Dibbles, your um, dynamic indicators of basic early literacy, or your Fontes and Pinnell. This is when you have a letter or a um, number that's attached to a reading level. You may be familiar with something called the iReady, which is a computerized adaptive program. If your school is using something like iReady, you may want to ask if there's a parent portal or a professional portal that you can access because you might have the ability to create some really interesting graphs that will track how your child is doing over time by using that parent portal. Um, I want to touch really quickly upon report cards. Report cards are really interesting. They're a wonderful way of figuring out if your child is at grade level for something like math or for um, language arts. For the younger kiddos, the kindergarten through second, third grade-ish, they can be really wonderful tools because they look at other social skills as well. So if you have a child who is um, struggling in areas of executive function functioning, but you know, he's really bright. Maybe you're dealing with a twice exceptional child. Um, look on your report card for items like, you know, um, listening attentively or organizing materials and belongings, focusing on tasks, working independently, and you might see some deficits there. So report cards can kind of be a handy tool. You're going to have your tutor and your related service reports. Um, this, is, these are, this is another wonderful way of looking at your child, um, but through a different lens. So this is going to be like a small group or a one-on-one -on -one format. And this is a way to figure out, hey, is my child learning better in this environment? Are they learning better in a small group? Are they benefiting from this particular methodology? It might be a way of... Um, and, and are they benefiting and not able to generalize that skill across other domains? It might be an indicator that your child um, really needs a different methodology or a different type of an environment. Your standardized formal assessment, that's going to be um, most likely your triennial evaluation. Um, this is a one-on-one -on -one evaluation. Obviously, it's a very specific moment in time and you're looking at what your child's potential is. It's really important to be looking at this type of assessment over a period of time. So you want to go back, I would say, at least three to five years. Um, we talked about 
your present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. We're going to talk a little bit later about your IEP progress reports. You obviously have classwork, you have teacher and service provider observations, and of course, last but certainly not least, you have parental feedback and parental um, input. Oof, that was a lot, okay. Um, for data to be meaningful, it really has to be specific to the goals, to the criteria in your goals and your objectives. And we will come back and talk about that um, a little bit more. Your data collection, as we talked about it at the onset, needs to be systematic in frequency. So it has to be um, consistent, it has to be ongoing, it has to be a regular collection of data. Um, your data has to be easy to collect. This is not rocket science. If this is difficult to do, it's simply not going to be happening. So it needs to be easy to collect. And once again, it has to be analyzed. It cannot live in a vacuum. Otherwise, it's no good to any of us. When you're analyzing your data, you are going to be looking through very specific lenses and you are going to be asking yourself, what are we trying to prove? Um, are there any patterns of performance? Are we trending upward in a certain direction with regard to a skill set? Are we trending downward? Um, I always come back to this question because it's really important, but does the data help inform if the goals and the objectives have been reached. So a lot of times, 90% of the time I'd say, if you're looking at your third quarter IEP progress reports, you're going to see that um, your child is making significant progress and perhaps that goal might be met. If you look very, very carefully within the comments section of that, um, of that goal, you might see that the data that's been collected is in no way reflective of what that goal is asking. So it's really, really important that the data has informed whether the goal has been reached. I want, I can't, I like, it's, you know, it's hard to move on without putting a, a, a little blurb in here about, about goals. Um, your goals in your IEP have to be observable and quantifiable. Um, if you were to Google SMART goals, you would come up with a plethora of, of hits. Um, so SMART goals have to be specific, they have to be measurable, action-oriented or attainable. Um, I like action-oriented. They have to be realistic and they have to be time-based, constrained in time. And your goals in your IEP are goals that are in there for a year's time. Um, your objectives may be for a shorter period of time, but your goals are in there, they're annual goals. Um, it's really, really important that if your goals do not make sense to you, if they do not relate to, or do they do, if they do not reflect to, reflect the performance levels of your child, you really should be discussing this with your IEP team. Um, I like to I like this slide because it sort of illustrates the pick the whole picture of what it is that we're talking about. We're starting over on the right where we're beginning with our baseline. Our baseline is, is kind of, I like to think of the baseline as being like your pretest. It's everything that your child knows before you start teaching your child. So you have your baseline, you're collecting your, um, you're, you're figuring out where your starting point is. What are your present levels? That picture of where your child is in, is informing your IEP goals and your objectives. And those goals and those objectives are going to be observable and they're going to be quantifiable. And in turn, those goals are going to inform what kind of data you are going to be collecting. That data, as we talked about, is going to be systematic, it's going to be easy to do, 
and it's going to be analyzed. And when you analyze it, the goal is hopefully that you are closing the gap on that skill or on that need or on that deficit. Okay, so let's talk about moving to what we can do in terms of documentation um, in our remote environment. Um, this is a very common adage. If it's not written down, it didn't happen. Um, you may have heard this countless times before. I simply can't emphasize this slide enough. Um, please, if you are seeing anything, um, observing anything, please, please, please write it down. Goes without saying, it's got to be written down. So let's jump in here. How do we gather data during the pandemic? Um, I have tried to demystify this for you um, by breaking it down into sort of three steps here. First, you really need to study your IEP and become best friends with it. Um, it, it is a murky document, but you have to dissect your present levels. You have to know your strengths and weaknesses of your child as they are documented in the IEP. Really want to understand the goals and the objectives and the program that is set out for your child. You're then going to need to identify and or I put determine what your baseline is of skills. Where is my child performing right now? Um, you may find it helpful to go back and review your January or your March 2020 IEP progress reports. Um, that might be your starting point. You might have more recent assessments that have been done. You might feel that there is a very big disconnect between what's written in your IEP for present levels and where your child is performing right now. And in that case, you might want to test a few skills. We're going to talk about how you might do that. And then the third is the biggie. This is when you're gathering and you're creating and you're maintaining your data. And before I jump into how you can be doing this, I really, I really want to emphasize to you that this documentation and this data collection from home, it's really an art and it's not a science. And um, as the best you can do is, is, is all you can do. So this is when you want to get out your notebook or your laptop or your table or your spreadsheet or your journal or your loose leaf piece of paper that you keep in a binder, whatever method works for you is just fine and we want to start to document what we're seeing. And there are three different buckets, I like to call it, of what would be worthwhile for you to be documenting. The first bucket is the delivery, I call it the delivery of services. And this goes back to the what that is being delivered to your child. What meaning the special education and related service, what are you getting? How are those services being delivered? And when are those services being delivered? Because as we know, in our remote learning environment, the how and the when is going to be very different. You also want to be tracking student engagement. And this is how is your child responding to the services? And these are this is commentary about your child's behavior, um, your child's participation, uh, his or her attitude. And then my third bucket is you want to be tracking or testing the skills that are in the IEP. And this really goes to your child's performance. So how is your child performing? So let's start with the first bucket. And this is the what services are being delivered how they're being delivered, and when they're being delivered. Um, you will want to try to keep track of, and again, um, it's not about perfection. You know, if you can get many of these items, terrific. Um, you're just trying to do the best you can. Um, if you can keep track of the date of service, and this is including your related services, duration and time of the service, the type of service, is it reading or math 
OT, PT, speech language, the delivery model, and this is obviously the big one, right? Are we um, receiving instruction over email? Is it phone? Is it online? Is it Zoom? Is it a small group? Is it a one-on-one -on -one setting? Um, it's interest, it's, it would be helpful if you can make a note of, is this synchronous, like I talked about before? Is this actually direct instruction that's being rendered? Or is this asynchronous? Meaning, does the teacher appear for you know, a hot three minutes and then directs your child to a website or a movie or, or something? So documenting that delivery model is really important. If you can, you want to try to note the goal that the service relates to, including any accommodations or modifications and the person who is responsible for your service. So that's the what and the how and the when. At the same time, you want to be checking out how is my student responding? Um, what is your child's behavior like? Is she engaged? Is she interested? Is she disinterested? Um, you want to look at focus, participation. Do you have to provide um, a lot of prompting? Does the teacher have to provide an unusual amount of prompting? Is your child answering questions? What does her body look like? Is she on the floor? Is she under the table? Is she slouching? Um, how much need for redirection is there? Basically, is this working for your child? Um, you want to note if there are any, um, if how your child's responding to any accommodations or any modifications. And you might want to write down if there's anything specific that's going on with your child that day. Um, I, again, this is a lot. It's a lot. You want to pull from it what you feel is manageable for you and easy to do. Um, I, you could Google some of these forms online and see what you come up with. Here's a, a student remote learning record that I pulled um, from the Federation for Children with Special Needs. I kind of like it. Um, you can see date, contact, teacher participation, notes, student feedback. Um, this is but one example of some sort of tracking record that you might find useful that you could create for yourself that's workable. Um, I want to go to our third bucket, and this is the tracking of performance. Um, I would suggest that you keep a notebook or one of those like accordion folders where you're selectively picking out work samples um, and keeping it in like a portfolio. I just think it's really helpful. You get that work sample, you put the date on the back, and you keep, it's a nice, almost like a, a living portfolio of what your child is able to do. Not every week, not every sample, maybe um, an item here and there that's obviously relatable to a skill or a goal that your child is working on. Um, you may feel that you, um, you may need to be testing the skills in your IEP. This is definitely um, something you might consider if you feel like the performance levels that are in your IEP are totally misaligned to where your child is given the pandemic. Um, I am not asking you to become a teacher overnight, um, but to the extent you're able to collect some live data about how it is that your child can, um, can or cannot perform a certain skill could be very helpful. So if your child is supposed to be counting coins, you can have your child do that for you. You could videotape your child reading a certain instructional level book. Um, you could have your child, you could give your child a spelling dictation and keep the, the written work product. You could give your child a writing prompt and see what they respond. And this would be your way of testing those skills that your child is working on in his or her IEP. Um, what's really important when you're tracking this performance is that you are tracking what your child is able to do over a period of time. So you're not going to just hold up that one spelling dictation and, hey, I did this once. 
really try to do it with some level of consistency. Um, once a week would be uh, incredible, but maybe twice a month or every 10 days or something so that you have a running record of how your child is performing. I put the, I, I, I have a little um, note at the bottom that if your child happens to be working with any private tutors or speech therapists or anybody else that might be able to assist you in collecting some data, some informal assessments, um, that's obviously going to be very, very helpful. Um, again, little by little, it becomes a lot. It's, this is not intention, it's not intending to overwhelm you. It's just giving you an idea of, of, um, of the types of, of data that you can be documenting from home during this remote time. You may prefer to track things weekly. Um, I wanted to show you this slide. It is um, a document I downloaded, a weekly distance learning tracking sheet from a wonderful organization in Connecticut called Special Education Equity for Kids. Um, I put this in here just to show you another modality for how you might want to be tracking um, some of these things at home. You can take the academic, you can take the domain that you're working on and ask, you know, how did your child respond to instruction or services this week? And you can see the items that are, are being documented, the baseline of skills, instruction, and services that would be akin to your what, how, when, and student engagement, and any progress that you're seeing. Um, I would be remiss to be talking about documentation if I did not also put a quick plug in for the importance of um, also documenting the types of communication that you're having with your school. Um, this is really, really important because again, if you don't write it down, it really didn't happen. So if you are having a communication with your school, please uh, get out your journal or your laptop or however you're keeping track of information and write down the date and the time the purpose of that communication, um, was it a phone call, was it a written email, and then put a little blurb in about what the result was, you know, what was the outcome of that correspondence, what was accomplished. Um, that's incredibly important. And while we're talking about, or while I'm talking about communication, um, you know, you should, you should and can be having conversations with your school about progress monitoring, you know, how are they doing it? Can I help with it? Um, is there anything further I can do? By the way, when are you doing it? Um, these are all really fair conversations to have and you might find some really um, interesting information that comes out of it and you, write, you might be able to help with this process. Um, I wanted to show you, you know, just to sort of demystify what these forms look like. Again, this is from the Connecticut Department of Education. This is a parent guide, guardian, excuse me, parent guardian um, communication record um, that might be useful. Okay. Um, now, you've been collecting data. What do you do with it? Um, you are going to be looking to identify the patterns of performance in the data that you have been collecting, the trends upwards and downwards, um, and you are going to want to share what you're finding. Um, you will want to present your data in easily understood ways. Um, this can be a graph, a chart, a table, a written summary, um, whatever you do, I would highly suggest that you make copies and you distribute it to each of the members in your team. Again, I think that work samples are very, very powerful. So you probably want to select some of your most salient work samples and also present those. But really, you're, you're trying to make a point of, of where your child is trending in relation to a particular goal. So if Lucy um, in March of 2020 had virtually mastered her goal, which related to reading 
um, CVC words, consonant vowel consonant words, and you notice that she can't do that anymore. Well, let me present to my CSE or my IEP, my IEP team. Let me present a little video, like a five or ten minute, five or ten second clip of here's Lucy trying to read those CVC words and see she can't read these words anymore. And by the way, she can't spell them either. And by the way, I did this in August and I did it again in September and I did it again in October. So let's sit down and talk about it. Um, you know, you can you can really do this for a variety of skills. Um, you know, my son Jeremy, he's supposed to be solving. Um, addition and, and subtraction um, word problems. He's supposed to be communicating his solution, labeling his answers, and doing this with no prompts. Well, I tried to do this with him when school started. He wasn't able to do it. Here's the grade level word problem that I gave to him. And, um, you know, let's talk about it. So that's the type of um, presentation or that's the type of data that you want to um, be pre that, that's the type of conversation that you want to be have. You want to be backing up um, your thoughts with, with actual data that you have. Um, you'll use this data that you are now presenting um, to address any past and new deficits at the, at the IEP meeting. Um, you will seek additional services based on student needs. Um, you might want to have a conversation about if a change in placement is necessary. Um, you definitely may want to discuss if there are any additional accommodations or any different modifications um, that, that might be helpful for your child in this remote environment. Um, students I know and put, you know, men, all, virtually all students have some level of, of novelty or difficulty, but I know that it can be um, particularly difficult for students with attention deficits to engage in a Zoom meeting or Google Meets. And you know, your child may need um, an extra layer of, of verbal reminders, or they may need a squishy toy to play with, or they may need to break down this new work that they're being asked to do into smaller chunks. So talking about additional accommodations and modifications is also something that you can be doing with this data. Um, does the student have a right to compensatory educational services? I have learned now that in New York they are calling um, compensatory educational services in relation to COVID times COVID impact services, which is interesting. Um, this co compensatory educational services is a topic of a whole other presentation, so I, I don't want to delve into it too much, but I just want to um, note that compensatory educational services, they are not provided for in the IDEA. Um, this is really discretionary relief that is provided to remedy an educational uh, deficit that is a result of a denial of FAPE, so a denial of a free appropriate public education, either in the implementation of your IEP or in the design of the IEP. Um, I'll also end by saying that at that meeting, it's a wonderful opportunity to really dig in and understand even deeper the how and the when of remote learning. Um, how, can, how are the services being provided and the when services are being provided if that is really not clear to you? Um, okay, it's a lot of talking. Um, be kind to yourself. I say this to my kids. I say this to myself. I, I, we are, you know, this is an art. It is not a science. Um, I, we are in the wild west and I'm not sure how much longer we're going to be in it, but it looks like, um, it, it looks like we're, we're in it for a little bit longer. Um, I, I really believe strongly that it's important to remain in a collaborative spirit with your schools. Um, you really, you want to engage in those quality discussions. You want there to be a very steady stream of communication. But you also want to be resourceful and you also want to problem solve. And you really want to be doing what you can at home in terms of 
documentation of delivery of services, engagement of your student and their performance, because presenting that type of information at your CSE or your IEP table can be incredibly impactful. So I am going to just um, share with you, I am gonna take questions. Um, I'm gonna, my contact information is here. It's ahalpert at litmancrooks.com. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now. I am going to look at the chat. I, I, I know that I have my colleague on the phone, Sandy Rosenbaum, and we are so happy to try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, will you share out a copy of the presentation at the end? Yes, we will. And this presentation has also um, been recorded as well. Um, what about situations where the teacher is asking the parent to monitor and report progress to them from virtual learning? Does this meet the teacher's or the team's responsibility to collect data? Um, I, um, I think it's a component in the, in, the collect in the data collection process. I wouldn't say that there's one um, and only one methodology for collection. I think you're always looking at data from a variety of different sources. And um, I think that it, it doesn't preclude the teacher's um, need to collect data him or herself, but it definitely can be helpful and it can definitely contribute. I don't know if that's entirely answering your question. Um, but I think that would be, Sandy, do you have anything more on that one? Not really. Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry if there was a, a issue with showing oh. the slides on slide six. Can you advance the slides? Um, as far as remote goes, does parent feedback have more credence? Um, I think that's a great question. And I, um, you know, I'm not, your um, CSE is required to um, consider your input. And I would say that if you are at home documenting and collecting data and able to present it to your team, but your team hasn't had the opportunity for reasons attributed to the pandemic, um, I think you have a very, very powerful voice. I think you're really uniquely positioned. I mean, that's really kind of the essence of, of the talk today that we're in such a strange time right now that um, if you're able to document and present um, and show these patterns of performance and your school is not, then, then you really, you're really very impactful. What if the school asks you to have your child stay late after school for their support time? Um, I am not quite sure what that question is. Um, what, what, I'm not quite sure what that question is meant to ask. Um, definitely, I would just go back to the how and the why. Uh, I'm sorry, the how and the when is looking very different right now. And I would urge you, I guess, to make sure that you have a conversation with your team about when and how these services are supposed to be delivered um, so that you can really understand what the program is for your child. Um, will we still be able to get compensatory education for missed services? So that is a really great question. Um, again, compensatory education services really is a much bigger topic that should be, you know, that should dive in, um, should be uh, addressed with a much longer presentation. But it's really important to know for compensatory educational services that it is a very individualized um, case by case analysis. Um, and so there's no guarantee that that one is going to be um, 
afforded compensatory educational services without a, a very careful individualized look at the child. Okay. Oh my gosh, I just, it did answer the question. Good. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I don't think I've ever listened to myself talk that long before. <laughs> Um, is there anything else from anybody? Um, I wanted to talk for a quick second. Um, I just wanted to go back to, we spoke a lot about goals and how they need to be specific and measurable and action oriented and realistic and time bound. Um, goals can be, um, goals can be confusing, um, but they really should be a roadmap as to what you're looking for when you're trying to collect data. So I like to break down a goal in terms of, um, you know, what's the condition? What's the foundation for the goal? And that usually begins with a word like given. You might see that in your, in your IEP. So um, given a grade level, a given a, a, a grade level of expository text, okay, that would be your condition. Given a grade level expository text, then what's the action? Okay, what, what is the action? Because goals have to have an action in them. Given grade level expository text, Lucy will orally read. Okay, that's the action, will orally read. Then what? Well, what's the target? Okay, given foundation and um, condition, given a grade level expository text, Lucy will orally read at 85 words per minute with two or few errors. That's your target. So you kind of want to look at your goals and you want to break them down into what's the condition, what's the action, what's the target. And the target might be different. So you might have an accuracy target. You might have a time limit target, right? The student must complete something within a specified time limit, or you might have a percentage, you know, a percentage relative to 100%. So to the extent that you can look at that goal and break it down into its component parts, I think is really helpful um, in trying to figure out how to, um, what kind of data you're going to be collecting. Um, Let's see, um, our school district asked us to sign a COVID plan listing the services being received. Have you seen this type of document and are there legal implications for signing it? Um, I would be very weary of signing anything that is um, reducing your access to what is afforded to you in your IEP. So my default is not to be signing waivers during COVID times. You don't want to be giving up, giving up what is entitled to you. Um, so I have heard of these types of um, documents sometimes being um, um, distributed and then sometimes being taken back to um, I, I just would be exceptionally cautious about that. Um, Sandy, anything else there? It's okay. I'm sorry, I'm a little confused about the, the muting and unmuting. That's and okay. The headset and everything. Um, yeah, I mean, I think didn't, um, you talked about uh, Amy, a, a school district that happened to be in Connecticut that was notorious in terms of having sent out like a, an advisory last year to mm -hmm. all the families that they weren't going to be providing any IEP services. Right, right. And then that was taken back again. Yeah. Yeah. And unlike in Connecticut, where I think you do have these COVID plans, I, there isn't a standard form for any kind of um, plan in New York's 
Oh. Is your mic so? Oh. Oh, Let's try. Is this better? Oh yeah, thank you. I'm I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, no, um, Amy had told a story about this uh, this um, district in Connecticut that had done this really notorious thing where they had announced that they weren't going to be delivering any services um, back they, in the spring. Yeah. Like they or said they, they, had they to, avoided. Uh, they, sorry, they were they were going to be. Um, um, they had to indicate if they were going to be remote or not, and then they might. Yes, it's something to that effect, correct? Go ahead. And so, yeah, no, there's been some really scary stuff. I don't think we've seen anything quite like that in New York. Right. Um, but I haven't really seen any individual plans that districts have done. Um, uh, districts do try, in some cases, to make broad statements about what modality they expect to deliver services if things are going to be hybrid that they expect to deliver all the IEP time you know while you're there um but it doesn't all oh. oh god too many things going on it's okay at the same time <laughs> Um, and I understand it's still not that easy to hear me. I think my headset doesn't work that well. Um, God. Um, yeah, no, I do, I do think it's difficult. I do think the districts are having a hard time figuring out what to say um, specifically to parents about when the services are being provided. Yeah, it's, it's just good to keep those channels of communication open and to keep um, asking for more definitive, a more definitive understanding um, because schools are accountable and they need to be figuring it out. Um, I see there's a private question that just came in. I see it's not presented as a waiver, um, more of a COVID reopening response, but it does list what the IEP provides and what is actually being provided, which is reduced and for interesting. Okay, so we inform them that we are not signing or acknowledging it. Great. Yeah, I, that would absolutely be the approach. Great. Wonderful. Anything else from anybody else? Sandy, putting you on the spot. Anything else that you want to add? I don't know if your technology issues are. Yeah, I, I think I resolved them. I just got rid of the headset, and okay. I'm just, uh, I'm just going me and my phone, which seems to be working. Um, the only thing that I was thinking about was the, the issue that had come up in my district about. Um, kids who are supposed to have like one-to-one -one support and that support really is um, whether it's a service or an accommodation it's not the program delivery itself but it certainly affects students ability to benefit from program delivery yeah. if they're remote and they're at home and they're participating in an ICT class let's say and the classroom is you know they their teaching assistant or their aide is not with them mm -hmm. um, working with them on the fly so i think when the modifications don't work it creates huge issues in terms of the accessibility of the curriculum yes for sure yeah uh, i was i was just talking about that question with our colleague who's Marion Walsh is not on the phone today, but or not on the call today, but that is a very, very difficult situation because um, it, it's really, really hard for those students that have that one on one support um, because they have to be supervised by a teacher. So you're um, it, it's it's almost virtually impossible in a remote learning environment. Um, very hard. Um, how long should we wait for a reassessment after returning in person? And should I call another CSE meeting to review the revision? Yeah, I mean, look, um, that's a really, that's a great question, right? How long is a reasonable period of time until your child should be reassessed? Um, schools are probably not going to be doing this um, as expeditiously as, as you or 
or I would like. So I think that, um, you know, I, I would, there, there's no magic answer to that, right? After you've been back in school, you've, at, you've established some sort of regularity in terms of a routine for, a, for some, you know, two weeks, three weeks, you know, whatever, whatever it is that, that seems and feels reasonable, I think you absolutely need to be communicating with your school about uh, reassessing or sharing what you've seen and bringing to bear what, what you can show by way of documentation. And so I guess what I would add to that, Amy, is that if somebody's listening today and they want to just start doing their first formal documentation in the next couple of days and they have hard documentation that shows that the student has made a significant regression then they don't need to wait they send that data with a note to the CSE that says that they want to meet because the child is regressing and this is the information they have right right absolutely yeah Yeah. Great. Okay. Perfect. So we are just about at one o'clock. Um, thank you all again for joining. I don't see any more questions in the chat, but you can certainly reach Sandy or myself or anybody else on our team at Littman Crooks. We are happy to answer your questions and support you during this um, this time in the Wild West. And um, um, it was a pleasure to chat with you all today. And I am going to sign off. And yes, the recording will be available and the PowerPoint will be available too. Um, and I wish you a wonderful afternoon. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.